Okay, Jeff, uh, this is my uh, Cal 39. It's a 40-year-old boat, mm -hmm. and the, uh, it's a great sailing boat, but the electrics are a problem right now, so um, I'm looking forward to an electric audit. All right, thanks for having me on board. I appreciate it. We'll uh, have a chance to look at it, review what we see, and then uh, make some recommendations on what's the best next steps for you to tackle. Great. Um, boat is about 40 years old. Um, pretty common uh, in sort of setup. There's good and there's bad. There's a few good things right away that I'm seeing. Uh, first of all, you'll notice that on your boat, I'm not seeing any wing nuts on the batteries. Um, that's one of the things that's commonly seen. Uh, people buy batteries with wing nuts. They think if they came with it, it's probably a good idea. But the reality is a boat has tons of vibration and you really don't want to have any wing nuts on a boat, period. Uh, also noticing that actually you've got uh, lock washers underneath uh, pretty much every one of the nuts, which is great. And so that's really good news. So you've got really good connections um, and I'm seeing both on the house and also on the engine battery. Commonly, especially group 31s or 24 or 27 are going to come with wing nuts and people are going to have uh, wing nuts on those. So that's the first thing. The next thing I'm seeing on this uh, battery bank, which I really like, is that you've got four golf carts here wired in 12 volts. So you can see there's parallel jumpers and each pair of uh, golf carts is wired in series. And what you'll notice is the positive and negatives are coming at opposite ends of the battery. And that's going to be essential to keep the batteries uh, or have the batteries charge and discharge evenly. So like that. Um, one thing I'm seeing right at the battery level is this terminal on the positive is starting to be pretty stacked. You look at the connections that you have and you actually have... Uh, one, two, three, and four. Now this is uh, misleading. It looks like it's a connection, but it's actually a temperature sensor. And it's a temperature sensor that's connected to your external regulator. And we'll talk about that later. And realistically, it doesn't need to be there. It, it can actually be on, ideally should be on a negative connection. And so it could easily be brought back to this one here, uh, considering that there's not much on this connection point. The other thing too that you'll notice on that connection, which is really interesting is, and this is essential, is the stacking of terminals. Stacking of terminals is a little bit like a pyramid. You put the larger blocks on the bottom, and as you go higher and higher, there's smaller and smaller blocks. In this instance, you can see there's a large gauge lug, and in between that, you've got actually smaller gauges that are impeding the current from and creating a resistance between the battery and this larger cable, which actually feeds your positive distribution for your whole boat. So, an easy thing here to remedy would be to simply undo this connection and actually stack always from largest connector to smallest connector. So that the smallest conductor, like something like this, which is a gauge 14, is not going to be carrying all the current that's going through this large gauge wire right over here. The other thing I'm noticing is this connector here is actually, you can tell, is actually runs your external regulator and it's actually unfused. So absolutely essential that this has to be fused. So that's about it. You can also notice that um, the batteries are in a container, which is great. And I'm not seeing any signs of electrolytes actually uh, on top of the battery. So that tells us that the batteries have not been overcharged or overfilled recently. Next, we're going to look at uh, what I'm looking at is I'm looking at this arrangement over here, which is your negative distribution. Um, first thing I see is that you've got what's called a shunt um, right over here. And, and this shunt is basically a single choke point and it's used to measure all the current going in and out of the battery bank. So the other good news uh, that I'm seeing right off the bat is I can tell that you don't have any negative connections that are done bypassing this shunt. So all the current goes through this cable, goes up, comes out, and then feeds a, po a negative distribution, a common bus. So that's the good news is that your battery monitor, based on this setup, looks like it's actually properly wired. So you're going to have an accurate reading on your battery monitor. Now, on the negative distribution, there's some hits. There's some good stuff and bad stuff. Um, one of the concerns that I have is whenever I see a connection like this, that doesn't have heat shrink. That's for me something that I'd like to have. Like you can see some of them have them. 
right? You got a heat shrink, heat shrink, heat shrink, heat shrink. But on this connection, you don't. And on this connection here, you can see right over here, you can notice the, the, the length of the heat shrink is too short. People buy heat shrink and they try to make it last. I see some owners that cut a hinge shrink down to almost a quarter inch. You know, I'm surprised that some people don't make it only, you know, an eighth of an inch. The point, it's not a seam protector. It's really to make sure that there's no moisture that's going to creep inside underneath the insulation and get to that wire because it might be untinned. And certainly when you look at a lug like that and a, that cable, you get a sense that it's probably welding cable. And if it's welding cable, it means it's untinned. And so it's even more important, especially when you have untinned cable, to make sure that that, like you hear on your, neg on your positive, you got to make sure that you've got about two inches of heat shrink to make sure that that connection is never going to get compromised and have corrosion, which is going to cause resistance, which is going to cause voltage drop. Yeah, that's actually the uh, negative for the windless. There so, you go. Yeah. So pretty important because uh, windlasses or any type of motors, starters, windless, thrusters, all those devices don't die because they're badly manufactured or they're not quality products. They'll generally die for one simple reason, and it's low voltage. Lack of voltage is what causes those devices to commonly fail. So, and then the other thing too would be the stacking of terminals. You know, making take the time to make sure that the terminals are properly stacked would be something I would recommend. Um, and I'm also noticing that some of the wiring has actually non-heat shrink terminals, and then some of it has heat shrink terminals, but the heat shrink is not actually... Um, uh, there's no heat applied to heat shrink, and so therefore that connection, there's a heat shrink terminal there, but it's actually not currently in use, right? It's acting as a butt connector, um, but the connection is not sealed. So that would be something else that would be that I would recommend to rectify. So that's on the negative distribution. On the positive distribution, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of few circuits, which I really like. Um, there's a lot of what are called MRBFs. And you can actually tell this is a marine rated battery fuse. And here's a dual MRBF being used, two fuse holder. And so you've got a lot of the DC distribution that's actually fused properly to make sure that if ever there is a short, that wire is actually not gonna be uh, shorted, but the fuse will blow. So, and you also notice there's a lot of spares, which I like, um, and that's really good. And um, so you, you want to make sure I can see there's already another connection here. Here we're talking about overall fusing. And you'll notice there's a jumper, caught my attention, leaves here. And it goes down, and it goes right down into this um, fuse holder right here. And it says H2O 40 amp. You'll notice the fuse is actually orange. And you can see a lot of the blades off that fuse. Notice below the orange. The, the orange itself, the blades on the orange are maybe only about yay long, maybe half an inch. And right now you can see that we're seeing at least a quarter of an inch or even more of that blade. So that means that that blade contact is actually only partially done. So it's really important that when you use those type of fuses, you actually jam that fuse all the way down. And what's confusing is the connections that are done need to be unscrewed with because they're actually, um, there's terminals underneath. And those Phillips terminals need to be undone so you can jam the fuse all the way in and then you actually retighten both the both sides, both the load side and the line side of that fuse so that the fuse can actually be brought all the way down. Yeah, that's why I, I jammed it in because I couldn't, I didn't that's right. loosen them off. Yeah, so that's common. Um, the other thing too you're noticing is over here we've got what's called an ACR. That's called an automatic combiner relay. And you'll notice there's actually three connections on that. There's one connection over here. There's another larger cable uh, that actually goes right over here. And that's, um, so basically allows that either the house battery or the engine battery are gonna be put in parallel whenever there's a charging voltage, which is around 13.3 volts at a 12 volt battery bank. But what's interesting too is you'll notice there's actually a fuse uh, below that and right here. And that fuse is actually um, really important because it's Point that out. yeah right over here. That yeah. fuse right there. That fuse acts as a protection to make sure because it's actually on a grounding connection, believe it or not. And that fuse acts as a way to make sure that the if ever there's a short on this circuit, 
um, your ACR is not going to be compromised because that wire is only gauge 10 and the, the, the positives are, they look like probably one aught. Um, so the positive distribution looks pretty good. I'm assuming there's a big welding cable here. And That's I, the positive for the, for, you, for the windlass? For the windlass. And yeah. it goes to a... Yeah, a circuit breaker right over here. Yeah, I, it's conveniently located here, but in an ideal scenario, this length of cable here is probably too long to be unfused. You know, um, if, if this was to code and we were building this boat, we would have another fuse over here because that length of cable to be unfused is unsafe in an ideal world. Now, I understand why you would do that because it's term... It's great if you're actually, you know, um, going somewhere and you want to make sure that your windlass doesn't accidentally get started or shorted while you're doing a, a voyage. You would, you know, just trip the breaker and now suddenly your windlass does, isn't energized. So it's in a convenient location for the operator, but there is a segment of that cable that is unfused. So on the engine battery here, what we're noticing is we've got a solar connection. And the solar connection is with a fuse, which is great. But notice also the stacking of the terminals. This connection should have been done on top. This is the starter connection. This has got probably a battery charger in the ACR. And this terminal should be, because it's the smallest, should be at the top. So that'd be something else to, to tackle. I also noticed the same thing over here with some other connection. And you can see there's no heat shrink, and we talked about that. That was applied. You've got the negative over here, and then the positive over here, but the heat shrink terminal, which is expensive, is actually, uh, no heat was applied to actually make it really, uh, I guess, heat res not heat resistant, but, you know, protect against moisture. Another thing I want to bring to your attention is over here, um, the code, the ABYC code says that you can only stack really six connections on a terminal post. And actually on this one here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six connections. So um, that's, that's definitely too many. I mean, over here you've got four, over here you've got four, and over here you've got only three. So um, that'd be something to look at, is there's too much stacking of terminals on that post. And that's about it. Um, now as you were looking down on the engine a little bit, the other stuff I'm looking at, especially on an on an engine or a boat of this age, is you want to make sure that you protect against chafe. Uh, you can see some sort of wiring harness over here. You can see it's loose, All right? Just um, over time, and given enough time, wires actually will chafe through. And um, it's actually quite surprising how many, especially on an older boat like this, how many uh, wires are, were installed without a fuse because a wire is going to work without a fuse. The fuse is only to help you in the event of a short. And so it's really essential to have chafe guard or make sure that over time wires don't chafe through and then make a connection. And the engine, you got to remember, is, is common, right? Common ground. So if ever a positive chafes through and touches the engine block, which is negative, you're going to have a dead short, which would cause a fire. So I just ordered on eBay a new uh, wiring harness for the engine. Okay, there you go. All right, um, so that's the DC distribution of this boat. And then um, things that I'm seeing as we back away a little bit is stuff like this. I mean, stuff like that is obviously, it's not great. Um, and it certainly makes you wonder what does everything do, right? And so then you can see, for example, something that worries me right off the bat is something like this. You know, you've got a wire uh, that is simply gone but hanging, and you can see that's another loose end of it, and it's just sitting there. It's really essential over time, especially when you're going to be troubleshooting, to make sure that all loose wires, if they, if they can't be removed, they get labeled, and it's a really good way for an owner to stop worrying about certain things um, would be something to consider. Um, another point that I'm noticing over here is you can actually see this clamp has actually disintegrated itself, rusted. Um, and there's electrical wiring that's actually uh, mounted here. 
Um, and that looks to me like the wet exhaust for the boat. Yeah, that's the mixing elbow, it looks like, I think. I'm not sure. But um, this is going to get really hot when the engine runs. So you really don't want to have any electrical wiring connected to that because um, it's going to get, it's going to cause this wire to overheat. So you don't want to run any sort of electrical wiring on a wet exhaust. All right, so here we've got a, uh, we're looking at, which is kind of rare, we're actually looking at the back of an engine panel. And um, a lot of them actually look like this. I mean, it's not inspiring, um, but this is certainly how a lot of them look. You can tell that things have been added, changed over time. Um, use of some labeling and some tape that become so brittle that they fall off. You can see that. Wires that have been cut and terminated, you know, not connected over time, peeled over. So at least there's some sort of labeling. Um, there's a solar controller over here. And you can see there's a junction box right beside it. And there's a remote control for it, where there's a cable. Um, so you've got some good over here. Um, what you find is, on, especially on a, on a wiring harness like this, you'll notice that there's, there's very few connections that are using actually um, uh, heat shrink terminals. Everything is kind of more automotive uh, terminals. So if you were going to rewire one of these, and it sounds like you ordered another wiring harness, I would be terminating all these connections with proper heat shrink so that you never have to do it again. Uh, you can see, I mean, just over here, for example, you can see the wires are actually starting to really show sign of corrosion because they're actually not tinned. None of these wires are tinned. Uh, back in the day, they didn't use tin wiring. And so it makes matters worse. So pretty essential to actually use heat shrink, which is what you've got over here. All right, you can actually tell. This is the heat shrink terminal right over here. So that was used on the instruments. Yeah. I'm always a, a big, uh, I think that as people do more and more bundles, and you can actually see with this bundle, people are adding tie straps, but they're not taking the time to remove the old ones. And I know it sounds silly, but, you know, as a boat owner, chaos is natural, order isn't. So if you want to look something that you're detail oriented, and you care about details, as a, and as a do-it-yourself electrician, you have to care about details. Every single uh, individual that works on electrical has to care about details. It's a detail type of business. You know, there's no reason to have one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, seven um, tie straps. You know, you can have, you want to have it supported, but as you go along, remove the other ones or include all of them, right? And all of that doesn't mean doesn't seem to make sense, but if everything's nice and neat, uh, when it's going to be time to troubleshoot, it's going to make it a lot easier. A lot easier. And that's something that an owner can do by himself. It just takes time and patience. And also make sure that you don't cut the tie straps like that, because over time what's going to happen is if you ever uh, run your hands, try to reach somewhere, you're going to cut yourself. And like you can cut yourself pretty seriously. Like I've got a lot of scarring on my arms from tie wraps. Uh, that were not properly cut. Here we've got a really, one of my favorite uh, battery chargers. It's not the only good one, but it's definitely one of the best ones. It's a ProNautic from ProMariner uh, 12, which is the voltage, nominal voltage of the battery. They come in 24 as well. 40 is basically the amperage. They come in 20, 30, 40, uh, 50, and 60. Um, you can have different settings for the type of batteries that you have. Um, they show you even the output. I mean, they, they're just, they're really good and they're quite reliable. What I like what I'm seeing here is you've actually got wiring that is actually going, this is a three output bank, but right now you can see because on this boat there's only two banks. There's an engine and a house. You've got three wires connected, a negative and two positive. And what's really interesting also to notice is there's actually a, sh there's actually a ground wire, a chassis ground wire. Many people don't install chassis grounds. Um, they, you know, inverters and chargers are going to work without them, but it's kind of like foregoing a seat belt in your car. You don't need a seat belt in your car uh, to actually drive a car, uh, but in the event that you're going to have an accident, you're going to want to have a chassis ground. And so that's one of the most common things that we see missed on chargers. Really like this charger. 
it's nice it's quiet good footprint um, they and they're they're very reliable uh, what I'm looking at is um, some battery switches and when I came on board I saw two battery switches and uh, I can see some labeling which is great labeling is great you can see engine battery um, and then you can see another one and so you've got an on off switch here and then you've got another switch here that wasn't labeled and it's got heat shrink on it and I wasn't too sure when I came in and I was trying to figure out you can see this is welding cabling right so with welding cabling, it's absolutely essential to put heat shrink terminals. Absolutely essential because the cable will corrode much easier than actually a marine gauge cabling. But you've got here an owner or someone, we don't know who did this, but uh, what we've got is you can see this is actually the feed coming from uh, the house. Goes in, you turn it on, then current goes here and goes to a breaker and then out and then back um, all the way to um, the windlass. This is actually not just a fuse. This is actually a fuse and also an effective switch. When I press this here, I've actually opened the circuit. So this switch is effectively redundant. There's no need to have this switch. It's basically the circuit is right now doubly switched. So you could simply go directly from the battery and simply remove this and have this cable come over here and then you would have the windlass just be on and off with this circuit breaker. Um, the other thing too that's really good about the location of those switches and we see this all the time is that battery switches need to be accessible. If the battery switches would have been down in this hole, um, yes, they would have been potentially the most shortest path between the batteries and the negative and the positive distribution. But the problem with that is that then it becomes really inaccessible to operate the switch in the event of an emergency. So you always want to have a battery switch that you don't have to go in a hole or under inside deep in an engine room to actually turn off. Because in the event of a fire, um, it would be nearly suicidal to actually go down in here while everything is smoking, you can't breathe, to actually go turn off that switch. Here we've got a fuse holder. A engine battery fuse holder and we've got a spare fuse which is great you don't have to put a fuse on an engine battery you really don't um, but if you're pretty confident in what the draw is of your starter you can actually put one in an a and l battery in this case there's a 400 a and l so it's probably generally on a starter circuit if you're going to use one you'd want to use a ratio of two to one so, you know, so that the engine obviously never uh, causes a nuisance trip. So here you've got an ENL 400 that's going to allow a big surge of current to go in, multiples of 400, but for a very small amount of time. So when the engine is turning over, um, it should be able to easily not cause a nuisance tripping on that fuse. And the advantage of putting one on an older boat is if ever the starter does get stuck or there's a dead short from the starter to the engine, which is common, um, you're actually not going to have a fire. All right, so now we're in the inside of the vessel, um, and we're about to look at the DC. Before it was the DC main distribution, now we're going to look at the DC panel. So the DC distribution down there was doing a bunch of circuits that were directly connected, and now here we've got a uh, DC panel. So you can see this is a DC panel that's undergone some changes. The first thing that I really like about what I'm seeing is you'll notice there's actually... Yes, new labeling. It doesn't, may not look modern than the way it was originally, but at least everything is labeled. It's quite common to see boats like this where you need to almost have a translator. Oh yeah, you know, steaming light is actually my running light. Uh, my fridge is actually my inverter. My water is actually something else. And so I really like that this whole panel is actually was relabeled. I think that's really essential, especially when things get crazy on a boat it's important to know where certain breakers are. The other thing too I'm noticing is actually even uh, the size of the breakers. You can see, you know, 15, 15 amp, 5, 5, 5, 15, 5, 5. So this is telling us um, the size of the breakers here. You can see there's actually three panels here. There's a DC panel with a battery monitor. We saw the shunt a little bit earlier. Naturally, it used to be other things here that have been removed. And this is another sub DC distribution and this is an AC breaker. Now on an older boat like this, um, there's no voltmeter, which if this was a new panel, you'd have to have a voltmeter. Um, 
and also you you have a reverse polarity light that's good um, and so that's kind of the front of the panel not a too unusual um, you know again uh, the front end of the panel looks really good so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look behind the panel and we're going to drop this down and here we've got I mean this certainly isn't what a DC panel on a new new boat would look like so there is definitely room for improvement here the good news um, and let's start with the good news is I'm seeing a lot it looks like someone maybe it's the owner or someone else has over time started labeling all the wires right and and yes this cable is going to a breaker that's labeled water pressure but now you can actually tell just from looking at the behind that actually you know here's we got an alarm and someone's taking the time to start labeling every not every wire but most of the wires so that's the good news um, you can see basically you've got feeds coming in right you got this is basically the feed coming in and you've got another feed coming in what's confusing about this as you can see is you're you you know on this boat they're using black wires for DC and then they're using red electrical tape to indicate that it's actually positive so that's something you've got to be really careful on an older boat like this um, that you always look for the telltale clues and if certainly if we were wiring this boat we would absolutely use red for for positive and yellow for negative so that's the good uh, first thing that concerns me right away um, and because it's a big safety factor is the back of this ac panel does not have a cover this is a double pole breaker um, if you touch any of these wires here you could die like i'm an inch away from potentially dying as simple as that uh, they've got a little bus protector here on top of uh, the hot that's feeding all these. Now notice actually all these cables uh, are actually red. Now that for me is a huge issue. Red is 12 volts. It's never, doesn't mean 120 hot. And here we've got red cabling actually indicating uh, 120. So that means that someone needs to actually really know what they're doing and they need to understand that this is AC and actually now we're using AC, and but we're using red. And so it would not be uncommon for maybe, maybe an amateur or do-it-yourself to actually think this is benign, like here, right? Everything here is 12 volts, and under, not understand that this is actually 120. And so if you touch any one of those breakers, when the, actually the breaker's on, you again can have a chance of dying. So I'm, there's, there's, I believe there's a lot of room to maneuver in a lot of things, uh, but whenever death is at play, and I'm not trying to make this a big deal out of nothing, uh, I simply think there's no excuse to have any red on any at all um, AC circuits, period. What's the color? It should be black, black and white. And you'll actually notice they, this is used out of convenience, right? You've got a cable here you know, black, white, and green. And what the owner did, or someone, or it could have been a do-it-yourself, it could be a mechanic, it could be a so-called electrician, probably had a big spool of red wire, wanted to, the wires were too short, right, uh, to reach this panel. And so what they used is they ended up using red uh, to extend all the wires, making back to the panel. And so that's an absolute no-no. We've got a neutral bus here, which is great. It's covered. Um, over time, it would actually be good to label those neutrals too. You've got a double pole breaker, um, which is, you need one, which is great. So this is the AC feed coming in. You've got a, a grounding bus, which is great. Well, it's, I really like that. The neutral bus, like I said, I like. Double pole, I like. Uh, but I really don't like that there's no back cover. You actually need to have a mechanical device to get access to that. You should not be able to just drop down a panel and get access to that. This side. This side you, you're fine, but AC you can't access so easily. So now that we're looking at, we've let go of the AC, um, I would look at now the DC side. And, you know, on my boat, to be honest, I had something similar when I got my boat. My boat is 27 years old. And my DC distribution wasn't like that built from the factory, but I can tell you that previous owners made it look like that. And what I did on my boat, and you see this with really new builds or bigger boats, 
um, what they'll do is they'll actually bring all these wires and they'll bring them to terminal strips. And so what you would do is you would bring all these wires, you take them all off the breakers and you bring them right on the back and you install in the back here um, a bunch of terminal strips. And these terminal strips would actually terminate all those wires. And then the great thing about doing that is the length of the wire is going to be long enough to reach all that back wall without using all these butt connectors everywhere. These butt connectors are going to really cause a lot of grief. Butt connectors just cause a lot of pain over time. So you take all of this and you bring them all over here on the positives, on terminal strips, and then you install those negative bus bars, not here, but again over here. And then what you do is you take from this terminal strips, you install and you route bundles of cables that go to this breaker and this breaker. And so what it does is it cleans. So over time, as you're adding new or taking new circuits or off, you're never actually going back to the breakers. You're always going back to the terminal strips because everything from here to there stays the same. And so what you would do is maybe you would oversize the wires so that as if you ever decided to change a 5 amp to a 15 amp, the any cable in that bundle would be able to handle 15 amps. And so that would be a really big um, thing that I would recommend doing on this boat. And what it does is it, it allows that when you lift, open, and close this, you're not going to have a accidental wires getting pinched, getting crushed, getting twisted, right? Because over time what's going to happen is that might cause the panels to, you know, act intermittently. You can actually see layering here. Uh, what I mean by that is you can see things that were done recently and things that are more legacy. You can tell this is a new, relatively new cable, right? So this is a new DC uh, cable that's coming from the, the common ground bus that we saw down below. Feeds here, there's a little jumper that comes across. And then you can actually notice there's another cable over here. Um, and what you commonly see on a lot of boats, especially with grounds, and it's really essential to, you should never, grounds are like, um, grounds are like trees. A tree never grows back onto itself, right? And when you talk about electricity, you really think about, people use words like trunk and branches. And a tree, as it leaves the ground, right, goes on a trunk. The trunk might then separate into other trunks and then eventually to branches. But a branch never grows back onto itself, right? So the sap doesn't turn in, in a loop, right? It actually goes out. And there's never more than one path to a leaf. You can only go from earth to a leaf on one path only. And when you're doing grounds on the boat, people think that more is better. And what they end up doing is they end up starting to look, oh, well, I'm going to have a path to the engine. I'm going to have another path to DC ground. But then they're realizing that their engine ground is connected to the common ground. And now what they did is they did actually a current loop. Because now what they're doing is like they think more is merry or merrier. So what you want to do if you're actually wiring your boat, especially on the ground, is you never, ever, ever want to have loops. It's got to be like a tree. A leaf has only one path all the way back to ground. And so here what we have is you've got a cable that's a legacy cable. We actually saw that cable. That cable is connected down below to the engine, right? And so it's a path to ground and it would be because remember, the engine is also connected to the common ground because the engine battery and the house battery are connected to the DC distribution common ground. That cable can be removed now that this cable is here. And that would give you one path to ground. So it's very essential as you add new paths to ground to remove the old paths to ground. The other thing too that you can see here is you actually have some, we're looking at the back of a source selector switch. And we're looking at another fuse holder. And notice this fuse holder, how the fuse is actually, you can actually click on the sides here, right? And if you undo these Phillips, you can actually screw that fuse all the way down. So, but to fit that fuse all the way down, you need to undo both of these slightly and then actually retighten them. So this fuse is not removable when both of these are actually tightened down. Um, so you've got a source selector. This actually uh, fuse holder and fuse is actually made to run this uh, small little inverter. And this cable over here is the ground that goes into this cable here and goes into this little portable small inverter. 
how do I choose what's the right breaker size? Well, first of all, a really common thing, if you're a do-it-yourself, which I would really recommend you get, is one of these clamp-on DC multimeters. Um, don't be, uh, I remember when I first got my boat years ago, and I was all excited, when to buy a tool, and then I ended up buying an AC model only. So make sure that if you buy one of these, you just don't go to Home Depot, because Home Depot is most likely going to just have an AC model. You want a DC AC model. And if you do that, you can actually clamp around a cable, and you could actually measure uh, the current going in and out of that cable. So if you've got a load and you're not sure what the load is, is my water pump drawing 2 amps or is it drawing 100 amps? Now I'm exaggerating, it's probably drawing 7 amps or 15 or, or maybe 5, it depends how it's running. Um, what you want to do is if you clamp on this around the cable, you can tell actually what the draw of the pump is. So you'd want to always make sure that that breaker is never going to cause nuisance stripping. Right? So you don't want to, if you're drawing four and a half amps, you don't want to have a five amp breaker. And the other thing too is if you're changing the breaker size, always make sure that the breaker is there to not just protect the appliance, but also protect the wire, the line in between the breaker and the appliance. So that line, for example, if you've got, I don't know, uh, you might be putting a water pump on board and you have a water pump and you're using a gauge 16 wire. Well, a gauge 16 wire is not going to be able to handle the loads of a water pump, right? Not a standard water pump. So you want to make sure that you always have at least the conductor between the appliance and the breaker that can handle the amperage that the breaker is going to give. So it's really about sizing, finding out what the load is with a clamp-on meter or simply reading the specs on the device if you can find them, and then making sure that the line feeding that appliance is actually the right size. And then you can size the breaker to only not only protect the line, but also protect the appliance. Is there a formula for the size of the breaker? Uh, no. Like twice if it's... No, I would say you probably want to do a ratio. Generally for nuisance stripping, I would say you probably want to do at least uh, maybe a 25%, you know, so you'd never get close. So if you've got, for example, a, a 10 amp breaker, you don't want to be running eight or nine amps out of that. Give yourself a little bit of room. Now, if you're getting specific, Really, these breakers are generally not to protect the appliance because you can't buy this breaker in 7 amps and 9 amps. or These are really to protect the line. What you'll end up having is a fuse, and that fuse is going to be very specific for the manufacturer. It might say, I want a 10 amp fuse. I want an 8 AGC. I want a fast blow 2. So what you end up having is a breaker for the line to turn the appliance on and off and protect the line, and then you'll have a fuse right before the appliance that's going to protect the appliance. And that's going to be extremely specific, and it's actually going to be specified by the manufacturer of the product. And those fuses, can I, can I use those automotive spade fuses? Yeah, absolutely. I love those. And absolutely. use them with a waterproof? Well, it depends where it is. You don't have to have waterproof inside the boat. Um, I don't think so. There's no need. But yes, those ATO, ATCs, automotive uh, fuses, blade fuses are great. The problem with the glass fuse, well, is sometimes they shatter. But also reading the label of what is the size of a glass fuse in itself is a life challenge. I mean, it's extremely hard. Even for some of my guys that are in their 30s, I'm, I'm only 40, 41, and I have a, I'm squinting. And depending on the light, it's really hard. What's great about the ATO, ATCs is they're color coordinated. Some of them come with built-in LEDs, so if they burn out, they actually are showing the, the light, the fuse is actually going to have a small little LED telling you that it got burned out. Um, and it's pretty obvious what is a 2 amp, a 3 amp, a 5 amp, a 10 amp. It's all color coordinated. And they're easy to take in and out. So I certainly, given a choice, um, not that every time you want to use an ATO, ATC, but given a choice, I would probably, most of the time, I would end up choosing an ATO, ATC fuse. All right, a common question that I get all the time from owners like yourself is, Jeff, I've got a battery switch. It's got an, it's a source selector off one, two, both. And I also have what you show me down below, which is an automatic combiner relay. Or an alternative to that would be, because that's just a marketing name, a VSR, which is a voltage sense relay. And why would I have both on my boat? Like, why would I have a voltage sense relay or an ACR when I have a source selector that gives me the ability to go both? The difference between the two is that an ACR or a VSR is effectively a digital solenoid uh, that puts your batteries in parallel whenever there's a charging voltage. 
and also disconnects them automatically whenever there isn't a charging voltage. And why that's essential for a boat owner is that over time, people will, yes, when the engine is running, will remember to turn the switch to both while the engine is running. But what's going to happen is there might be this occasion where you forget to go back to either one or two. And then what happens is you're at an anchor, you're using your fridge, you're using your appliances, you might be there for two, three days, and now you go to start the engine, and what you did is you actually drained both the engine battery and the house battery. So now both of your both banks have been brought down to 50%, and you go to start the engine, and maybe it's cold. Maybe the engine battery needed to be 100% to start the engine. You go to start it, but you don't have a backup. And so that's what's really nice about an ACR or a VSR, is it allows the, an owner to actually have the batteries be put in parallel whenever there's a charging voltage automatically without their involvement and also to have them disconnected without their involvement. So we end up putting hundreds and hundreds of these ACRs and VSRs on boats as a way to provide automation for the owner. The source selector switch is then used more for ways to manually put the batteries in parallel, right, on all or both whenever you want to charge the engine or run the engine and your engine battery is weak. So it's something that you would do un rarely as opposed to every time you run the engine. Another question that a lot of boaters ask themselves is, Jeff, okay, I've got here I've got a source selector switch and I've got a source selector where one is house, two is engine. I'm at an anchor, I've enjoyed, I've been there for two days, uh, I'm on one. Should I start the engine on my house battery or should I start my engine or start my engine on the engine battery, the dedicated engine battery, which is on two. Yes, of course, you could start the engine off battery one, but it's a little bit, you want to confirm every time you start the engine, you want to confirm that your engine battery can do it by itself, not with the help of the house, but you want the engine battery on its own to prove to you every time you start your engine that it can do it without hassle, without any hiccup, without any difficulty, because what that gives you is it gives you confidence that you have a good engine battery. Because an engine battery is relatively inexpensive to change. And you want to go out, you want to know every time you go out that when you're going to actually want to come back home, you're going to be able to start that engine without problem. And that's why I always emphasize to owners to never have the battery switch on both to start an engine. It's like walking around with a cane. Yeah, sure, you could do it, but wouldn't it be nice to know when you are limping as opposed to have a crutch right there ready to take your weight all the time? And then then who are you going to call when you need more help? If you're always starting on both and something doesn't work, well, what's your backup? You're always using your backup. And so it's essential to keep separation of an engine and a house battery so that you always know if you start having a weak battery, you know that you need to either resolve it yourself or call someone to help you resolve this problem. One of the most common things that we recommend boners to have, especially if you're going to actually use your batteries in a deep cycle application, meaning you're going to actually leave the dock, stay one night overnight or maybe multiple nights or go on a cruise for an extended period of time and you're actually using your batteries and cycling them, is to install what's called a battery monitor. And a battery monitor is essentially a fuel gauge for your batteries and also a speedometer for your batteries. Fuel gauge means it tells you the depth of discharge of your batteries. It tells you in a percentage, are your batteries at 100%, are they at 80%, are they at 20%. And so it gives you in a percentage what is the capacity of your batteries, very similar to what a fuel gauge would do in a fraction, half tank, quarter tank, full tank, which is nice. And also a speedometer tells you how fast you're either charging the batteries or are you depleting them. And the rate at which you deplete your batteries is essential because that tells you if you're actually left a load that you shouldn't have, or maybe you start managing your load so that you're going to start conserving power so that you can stay at an anchorage for longer. And so when you are, batteries are a little bit like money. You, you know, it's one of those things that you rarely have enough of and you want to actually conserve. And so by knowing the rate at which you burn power, right, the amps coming in and out, you're going to be able to start maybe changing your behavior and start basically conserving power and saying, well, do I really need all these lights on? Should I leave the chart plotter on when I'm at anchor and I'm not using it? What are things that you can turn on and off so that you start conserving power so your battery banks, whatever you have, last you longer. And on this boat, we've got actually one of, our, one of our most popular battery monitors. And you can see it's over here. It's actually a Victron battery monitor. Now, what that device shows you right now is actually it shows us the voltage. So if I choose the up and down arrow here, 
right now what we're seeing is we're seeing a voltage of 13.98 and that is actually at the house battery. If you go down and we select, we're actually seeing right now what that means is we're actually 13.98 is a float charge and we're actually seeing right now 0.15 amps going into the batteries. So that's effectively a float current. Two watts is another way to look at it. It's amps and watts instead at the voltage. And here we've got amp hour. So what that tells us is the battery, and you've got a little indicator over here that tells you the battery is completely full. And with batteries, zero means full and negative is actually, you're always thinking about a little bit like a line of credit. You know, if you've got a line of credit of, you know, maybe $500 or $1,000, if you've got no dollars in your bank account, you're going to start with zero. And you can go all the way to minus 1,000 or minus 500. A battery monitor looks at the same thing. Battery capacity is always in the negative. Here's the other uh, value here, what we're seeing is that at zero amp hours, you have 100% of usable battery capacity. Um, this, this here is infinity and it's not so relevant for boat owners because the current draw on a house battery fluctuates a lot throughout a day. And this is actually predicting how long are your batteries gonna last based on the last four minutes or 32 minutes or 16 minutes. And since loads coming off irregularly, It'd be, it's like a little bit like driving a car in the city and saying, oh, right now in the city, I'm doing 30 kilometers an hour. Therefore, if I drive in the city for the next two hours, I'm going to have covered 60 kilometers. The problem is your speed in the city varies continuously. And so does your amps on a boat. You know, suddenly the water pump comes on, comes off. And so you're going to find yourself where you might have the water pump come on. It's 15 amps. The fridge turns on another five. A light gets on a light comes off. All those loads are coming on and off, and it's really like driving a car in the city. You look at the speed in the city, the speed is constantly doing that. And it's really hard to take that speed and say, over the last 30 minutes, my average speed is 40, let's say kilometers an hour or 40 amps, and therefore my batteries are only gonna last this amount of time. So pr time prediction on a battery monitor is really hard. Uh, but what isn't hard is knowing where you are at at any given moment, i.e. your fuel gauge in a percentage, or knowing the, the speed at which you're using power at any given time. And over, over a period of time, while you're looking at your battery monitor, you're going to be able to start sussing out or assessing, oh, is this normal? I'm you know, about to call it for the night. I'm looking, I only see three amps. Or I'm going to call it and I see 20 amps. What's on? Why do I have 20 amp draw on my boat? What did I leave on? Did I leave the radar on on the chart plotter? Uh, are there lights on that I don't know? Did I leave my running lights on? Is my anchor light on or off? Or maybe you're going to bed and it's a draw of zero and you're like, well, where's my anchor light? My anchor light is incandescent and it should be drawing two amps. So it starts, you start getting a feel for it because you've got a feedback and it allows owners to start managing their power on their boat better. Jeff, how much power am I using on my boat? What's my daily amp hour budget? And also, do I have the right batteries for that? And also, how am I gonna recharge? How am I gonna meet my daily demand? So with a battery monitor, you can start figuring out because you've got a history, right? You can see over time, oh, I started from 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. for 24 hours. I use today 125 amp hours. Next day, I use 137. Next day, I use 105. And over time, you're going to start having an average. And that average is going to tell you, depending on the season, and it should change on the season because our power consumption changes depending if it's a shoulder season, winter, or summer, what is your average amp hours? And you've got to consider what are the big loads on a boat? The biggest load on a boat, pretty much up to 70 or 80 feet, is refrigeration. Refrigeration is proportionally always the largest load on a boat because as the boat gets bigger and bigger, there's simply more and more fridges. And so at this latitude here, um, with the type of compressors we have, fridges generally run at a half duty cycle. Meaning if you've got a fridge that runs at five amp draw, five amps for 24 hours times 0.5. So that's five times 24. You call that 120 divided by two. So that's a 60 amp hour low just for that. Now, if you, for example, on this boat, you have a water maker, the water maker draws 26 amps. Let's say you run it for two hours. That's two hours at 26 amps. That's 52 amp hours plus the 60 for the fridge. You're at 112 amp hours just to start off with, plus then some water pumps, a little bit of lights, and maybe a little bit of the inverter, a little bit of the instruments, a little bit of the VHF radio. And so then you can find yourself, you know, maybe having on the days you're using the water maker, maybe you're using 150 amp hours a day. The days that you aren't, maybe you're using 100. 
So now you've got a range. You know, is it 100 to 150 amp hours a day at 12 volts? The next question is, okay, so we've got a battery bank, and on this boat, we've got a battery bank that's four golf cart batteries. Great. Both battery, two sets of batteries are wired in series and then put in parallel. Marketing would say maybe it's more than 400 amp hours, but I would say, let's pull back. Let's just call it 400 amp hours. So 400 amp hours where you don't want to bring the battery because they're flooded less than 50%. You bring that down, 50% of 400 is 200 amp hours. But we also know that at bulk charging, the top end takes forever. And so now you're looking at from 85 to 100 is not really usable. So effectively, on this boat, you would have from 50 to 85 is really kind of your theoretical range. And so that gives you a third of 400, which is around 135 amp hours, which seems to be what you're using on this boat every day. So this battery bank would be properly sized for pretty much a day, a day and a half of typical use. Now, what gets interesting is on this boat, there's actually solar. So on this boat, there's actually an array on top of the Bimini and an array on top of the Dodger. There's 300 watts on top of the Bimini and 80 watts on top of the Dodger. So that gives us 380 watts. We've been promoting and, and encouraging owners to consider solar for over five years now. And on my boat, I've done it as well. And we've probably have over 250 installs. And on these installs, what we've noticed, and I have a lot of our clients that are kind of a little bit geeky like me, that are tracking their daily outputs of solar. What we've noticed is for owners that are using solar here, like in the Pacific Northwest, you know, from Puget Sound all the way to Desolation Sound, not Alaska, because God knows what's going to happen to the weather. You might not see the sun for a whole summer up there. You might, but you might not. Staying in this kind of vicinity of the Pacific Northwest, you're looking at a ratio between watts and amp hours is a factor of four. And yes, I know there's a long formula, but luckily there's a shorthand. And the shorthand is if you've got a 100 watt panel, in this latitude, in the summer, from May to end of August, you're looking at 100 divided by 4 is going to give you amp hours. So on this boat, you've got 380 amp watts. 380 watts divided by 4 is going to be uh, just a little bit shy of, I don't know, it sounds like 95, 95 amp hours a day. So on this boat, assuming the solar panels are good quality, that the controllers are MPPT controllers, that the wiring is actually doesn't cause a lot of voltage drop, you're going to get about 95 amp hours a day of output from those solar panels. And that's not the best output. If it's beautiful, sunny, blue sky, you're going to get maybe probably divide by three. So you would get 380 divided by three. And if things aren't going so well, it might be 380 divided by five. So your range is really between divide by three if you're optimistic and things are gorgeous blue skies to pretty cloudy, not end of the world cloudy, but pretty cloudy is divided by five. On average, it's four. So on this boat, with 95 amp hours a day of solar, you're pretty close. If you're running the water maker maybe only for one hour and you're running out of other loads, you might find yourself on this boat to be able to have maybe a 100 amp hour budget a day. And so right now at 95, you're pretty much close. 